Good to see you tonight. Appreciate you being in the house of God. Uh, Aaron, you don't care to pull up the uh, in-house slides there for a second. Uh, but it's good uh, to have you with us tonight uh, for our second uh, Woody Caldwell Conference on Creation. Uh, Brother Woody was a longtime member here at the church. Uh, and his story to me is one of the most in interesting stories of a man's life. Brother Woody uh, taught a creation Sunday school class here at the uh, church for well over 20 years, 20, 25 years. Uh, I got to know Brother Woody, uh, Brother Allen, Brother Steve Fallings, good to have both those guys with Alan White. Uh, if you remember when we had our first Woody uh, Caldwell Conference on Creation, the three of us were the speakers, and it's good to have both of them with us tonight. But Brother Woody had the amazing uh, privilege uh, to have actually been discipled by Henry Morris. And Henry Morris, of course, kind of helped kick off the modern creation movement. But beyond that, Brother Woody actually helped proofread the engineering sections of the book, The Genesis Flood, that actually kicked everything off. But Brother Woody was a uh, staunch creationist, taught here for over 25, I think 20, 25 years, taught just the creation class. And before he passed, he asked me if I would keep teaching his class. And uh, as of last Sunday, we started back in Genesis chapter number 6. Uh, we've covered a lot of different ground in the last few years, but uh, it's just a privilege to have each and every one of you here. We thank you for coming. Uh, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and we'll uh, get uh, kind of take care of some uh, important things that you need to know, and then we'll turn uh, Dr. Carter loose on you. All right, Father, we love you. We do thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Father, how I thank you for each person that's here. Father, I pray that as we uh, spend time in your word and in your world tonight, that you would speak to us and show us wonderful things out of both of your books. Father, we, love, we just thank you for the privilege that we have to learn. Thank you for Dr. Carter, CMI, the ability that, uh, they, that you've given them to be such a witness in the world uh, that we're in. Father, I pray that you just bless him tonight and tomorrow. Use him in a great and mighty way. We'll thank you and just give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just as a housekeeping announcement, just to let you know, if you, at some point you need to run to the restroom, go through that door, turn right, there's the men's. You go this way and turn left, there's the ladies. Uh, so if you need to uh, take a bathroom break, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. Also, I know you saw it when you came in, uh, but please take advantage of the resources that are out there on the table. Uh, and, and you will learn more than you can ever imagine. I can actually claim to have been the first person to buy anything at this conference. Uh, we were testing out the system to make sure everything worked, and I couldn't think of a better person to be a guinea pig. Uh, so I went ahead and bought, uh, I, I was telling uh, Dr. Carter while we were eating dinner, I said, I really hope that you brought Biblical Genealogy 101 with you. And he said, they're in there. So that was, a, before anybody got here, I'd done bought a book. And for those of you that know me, I know you're not a bit surprised. Uh, but, uh, but I do appreciate uh, the resources that are out there, something for all ages. Uh, and so I really, I know he's going to talk about some of them as part of his talk, so I'm not going to steal that part of the thunder. Uh, but please take advantage of the resources that are out there. Uh, and then... Uh, real quickly, just to give you an overview, that's his, this one's mine. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of the talk, tonight we're going to be looking at two topics. One, what Darwin didn't know, and then secondly, uh, well, excuse me, genetics according to Jesus. So that's going to be the two talks tonight. Now, I know we've got a lot of visitors with us, and I don't, you know, I don't like, to, I, I, I would never try to steal people from another church, but I'm going to say this come <laughs> because you're going to be blessed uh, by the presentations tomorrow uh, dinosaurs and the bible uh, the alternative that's at 10 o'clock uh, we're going to have all the kids up here from sunday school as well because that's a topic that they love and and i know it'll get their entrance uh, interest at 11 o'clock then uh, we'll have creation's competitive edge and then tomorrow night at six o'clock uh, we'll be looking at evolution's achilles heels Notice the plural there, Achilles heels. Uh, so please uh, come out, and uh, like I said, I know uh, you're going to be absolutely amazed at the things you're going to hear. I got one other little thing. I, we've got a family here in the church, uh, and they have a ministry called Keeping Faith Woodcrafts. 
and uh, they came to me, uh, I don't know, two weeks ago, and said, would you like to have something to hand out as door prizes? And I said, I would love it. Uh, so I've got a door prize here. This is uh, from Keeping Faith Woodcrafts, and they're puzzles. And they're puzzles of mammoths and dinosaurs and all kinds of cool stuff. The one I don't have is the mammoth. I'm going to have to talk to him because uh, <laughs> I don't have this one. Uh, but this is going to be the first door prize. So let's look. let me ask a question. Who came from the farthest distance to be here tonight? All right. Anybody outside of Kingsport? Anybody outside of Kingsport? All right. I know Gate City. Weber City. How about you, brother? Johnson City. Limestone. Anybody else? I think limestone has it. Uh, so here you go, brother. And I said we'll do one for each of the presentations. Uh, on this Appreciate it. Appreciate each and every visitor that's here tonight. I know the, like I said, I know everything's going to be a blessing. So without further ado, like I said, we've got two different talks. We've got some things going on in the middle to make sure. Uh, you've got a, you know option, uh, time to look at the resources, those kind of things as well. Uh, but want to go ahead and introduce to you, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Carter. Uh, he and I'm not going to read the whole bio that was on the website, uh, but he is more than qualified uh, to be up here tonight. He's got a wide range of expertise in a lot of things. You'll notice if you go out there, his name's on some of the books and some of the DVDs. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to him. And so you pray for him as he comes. All right? Come on, brother. I think I came the farthest, actually. The same. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday to hear me. I'm actually humbled, um, but very, very pleased. I have several things on my heart that I wish to share with you. And honestly, the first thing that struck me was the age of the audience. It is very difficult to reach the younger generation in America today. They're busy, they're um, distracted, and um, just the atheistic mentality is so palpable and so strong, it is very hard to swim upstream. So hopefully, we all can learn something tonight and tomorrow morning that maybe we can use to talk to our nieces and nephews and grandkids and the neighbor kid down the street. Um, the first presentation I have for you, my intention here is not to attack Charles Darwin. That, not at all. The, the purpose here is let's learn more about the man so we can understand the theory better. And honestly, uh, most today's evolutionists, they don't care what Darwin believed or what Darwin taught. They're way beyond him. But if we understand the background behind this, I think it's going to affect the way we look at the theory in general. So I give you to you what Darwin didn't no. Now, if you would like to plug into some of the information stream that CMI is producing, uh, we are constantly making new stuff. I mean, we have about 30 speakers on the road. We're going to visit about 1,300 churches around the world just this year. We are constantly writing articles. Um, every week on our website, at least three or four brand new articles pop up. We have a magazine. We've making, we have made four movies. We're about to do a whole long eight-part video series on biblical Egypt. Um, it's in the works. I have a book coming out uh, in the near future. We're really busy, but we like to take the information to distill it down to bite-sized pieces and send it out to all the people on our distribution list, and that's what InfoBytes is for. It's basically every Friday, we're going to send out a list of really cool uh, information things for you. And honestly, I use this myself. Who's got time to go visit creation.com every single day? I'm, I'm sitting in the office. I don't have time to read our own website, right? Um, and so what it does is it comes out on Friday, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. And I, I scroll down, oh, I wanted to read that. Click, and I can actually read my own information. So this is there for you if you want to take advantage of it. Um, I have a volunteer or two. They're going to be handing out a sign-up form that looks like this. Can you do me a favor as he's going around? Just pass them around. And when, if you're like the last person, can you just pass them to the end? Because they're going to collect them in about five minutes or ten minutes. All right, you can do that now. Thank you. Those are going around, and let's start talking. I'm going to use this verse in every one of my five presentations. 1 Peter 3.15. To sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Now, meekness doesn't mean weakness and fear doesn't mean trembling. 
which basically means gentleness and respect. But this is for the person that's asking the question. There are times to answer aggressively, but usually not. You know the, the, the verse, um, be angry and sin not? Yeah, I can't figure that out. <laughs> so I'm applying this to myself even when I'm engaging with radical, um, very bitter, uh, lying atheists. And I run into them. And they don't tell the truth. And yet, I do this because my Irish temper flares up, and after that happens, I lose the argument. Right? So I'm going to apply this to me. I'm going to apply this to Charles Darwin also. I want to study this so that I can answer the questions better. And I'm going to give you three things that Charles Darwin did not know. He did not know modern geology, modern biology, and there's no shred of evidence whatsoever that he understood some of the basic presuppositions of Christianity. Now, he started off as the son of a rich man, a society doctor for rich people. Um, his father was a doctor. His older brother got sent to uh, study medicine at Edinburgh. And well, Darwin's, Charles Darwin's the second son. What are we going to do with you, son? Well, I'm going to go study medicine also. Uh, but he couldn't stand the sight of blood. And so he failed out. Well, <laughs> no, he, he left to pursue other things. No, actually, he failed out. He could not handle medical school at the time. Of course, this is before um, anesthesia was invented by a Christian, by the way, who said, you know what? If God put Adam to sleep to operate on him, I bet we can put people to sleep. Cool. But that had not yet been invented yet. And um, even though Darwin had, he, he even said of his own work, I think there's a direct quote, he had an inordinate fondness for killing he was a hunter, and he loved killing things. There's one, one time, he writes in his own journal, he's walking around one of the islands in the Galapagos with a hammer, just whacking birds on the head. You know, when people torment animals, that usually alerts the authorities that they're probably an axe murderer. Um, and he fits some strange things. But see, his older brother um, became a drug addict. And so the family pensioned him off, and Charles Darwin got to inherit the estate. If that didn't happen, we would not have anything called Darwinian evolution today. But he leaves Edinburgh, and he ends up at Cambridge. So what are you going to do with now? Well, you're going to be a priest. You're going to study for the priesthood, Mr. Charles. And so he goes through Cambridge, and he gets what's you know the equivalent of a, a, um, a liberal arts education. But interestingly, the Anglican Church of England, training their own priests to take over pulpits, he never once had to open the Bible. That's the state of the Anglican Church in the 1800s. But when he's done, he calls himself a geologist. Oh, I'm so I'm confused now. He's a, a failed medical student with a degree in theology, the father of evolutionary biology later on. He's calling himself a geologist. What's going on? Well, he's one of the last batches of the classic Victorian gentleman who was expected to have an understanding of almost all of the knowledge out there. It was almost becoming impossible at this time, and within 10, 20, 30 years, no one could handle all the information. You had to start specializing. But he was a generalist, and you can notice that in his writing, he doesn't talk about details. In fact, he never ran a single experiment his entire life. He wasn't an experimentalist. He was a philosopher, more than anything. Not a good philosopher, but he was basically a philosopher. Now, I'm going to say he had three tutors. Not really, but three I have identified three specific people in his life that had a profound influence upon him. One was his grandfather, Erasmus, who wrote a book about evolution. What, I thought Charles Darwin invented evolution. No, not at all. No, not at all. Most everyone in Charles Darwin's circles were already evolutionists. They just picked him to be the poster child to get out to the world what they already believed. His grandfather had written his book about evolution, but it couldn't be like a science book. It was poetry, because in the 1700s, it just wasn't politically correct yet. In fact, the, uh, the grandfather had on his coat of arms in the house Darwin grew up on, the coat of arms, the diagonal part said, E. Conscious Omnia, all from shells. In other words, all life came out of snails. That's, that's what he was teaching. So Darwin was steeped in evolution from a young age. And then we have a man named Adam Sedwick, very important early geologist. He named the Cambrian era. The rocks around here are pre-Cambrian. The Cambrian era is when you start seeing, I, actually, I don't know about the rocks around here. I shouldn't have said that. 
There's a lot of pre-Cambrian rocks in this area. I bet there's some Cambrian ones also. But this is when multicellular life is first starting to appear on Earth in the evolutionary model. And Sedwick named it after the ancient name for whales, Cambria. And after, before Darwin's final year at Cambridge, he spent time with Sedwick in Wales studying biblical geology, or at least Sedwick's version. See, Sedwick, um, even though he was a Christian, he would, we would call him an old-age catastrophist, saying, yeah, a disaster happened millions of years ago and let, lay down this layer, and then another disaster millions of years later laid down this layer, and the last disaster, world disaster, killed off the dinosaurs. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. But if he was the, like the last generation of scientists who were still trying to wed, oh, sorry, secular scientists, who were still trying to wed the Bible and science together. He was doing a pretty poor, poor job of it, and it gave Darwin a demonstrably untrue version of history, which he was able to reject when the next person came online, Charles Lyell. When Darwin got finished with um, his, his undergraduate training, he got chosen to go on a five-year voyage around the world. It was a mapping expedition. So the ship, the HMS Beagle, was going from area to area all around the world with lots of time off. They would just park, and they'd send people out, and they'd do all this mapping. And so Darwin had all this free time to romp around South America and the South Pacific Islands, and he's like a kid in a candy shop. He has no responsibilities. In fact, you might have heard um, Charles Darwin was a ship's naturalist. Uh, that's not true. The ship's doctor was a ship's naturalist. Darwin was chosen because um, the captain needed a dinner companion. That's the only reason. Because in Victorian society, the classes didn't mix, and the captain was from an upper class. He would, ha had, he would have had no one to talk to for years. So, actually, Darwin was a third choice. They finally found this guy who was willing to go on this ship, so away he goes, and Captain Fitzroy, the later on the anti-Darwinist, Captain Fitzroy, the committed evangelical Christian, hands Charles Darwin, when he gets on the ship, a brand new copy of a book, Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, which argued the present is the key to the past, slow and gradual, count up the layers, count up the years. It's called uniformitarianism. Now, geologists today are not uniformitarian, but this is Charles Lyell, and so Darwin's got nothing to do except read Lyell's book, and he soaks it in, and now he's calling himself a geologist, he rejects Sedwick, he accepts all these millions of years idea, and he goes to some place like this. This is Isla Tortuga in the Galapagos Islands. I've been here. We've gotten a boat one all around this thing. What is that? What is it? It's a rim of a volcano, right? But notice it's eroded on the southern shore. All of, oops, sorry, loud, all of the islands in the Galapagos slope from the north to the south because all the weather comes from the south. The rain hits the southern shores before the northern shores. In fact, if there's a, um, a rainforest, it's on the southern part of an island. If there's a desert, it's on the northern part of an island in the rain shadow of the mountain. But Darwin went here during what we would now call a, um, a La Nina year, where everything is extremely dry. And these desert islands obviously must have taken millions of years to erode because there's hardly any rain here. Slow and gradual, millions of years. The presence is the key to the past. I don't see any rain today. Oh, this heavily eroded landscape would have taken a very long time. And the millions of years idea filtered into his brain, except he didn't know about El Nino, which is starting up right now. And during El Nino years, this becomes lush and green. A single storm, in fact, even during a dry year, can cause 10,000 years worth of erosion in one night. Because the present is not the key to the past. But he's thinking that. See, he didn't know anything about modern geology. In fact, he, according to Lyell, he's teaching that things slowly rise and slowly sink over millions of years. That's why there's shells on top of mountains, because the mountains used to be underwater. And they rose. Well, no. Modern geologists talk about plate tectonics, horizontal movements, not vertical movements. The horizontal movement can cause a vertical movement, but the primary thing happening on a, the surface of the earth is plates moving sideways. 
He didn't know anything about that. Oh, by the way, um, the Galapagos Islands, that is nothing. I can do it here, though. I can't do it here. The Galapagos Islands is at a triple junction. There's three plates coming together, and one of them is going underneath and melting. And the first thing that boils off when a plate starts digging down are the uh, silicate-bearing minerals. And that's where you get explosive volcanoes. That's Galapagos Islands. Now, do I believe in plate tectonics? Yeah, I sure do. There's too much evidence to say otherwise. But I believe in fast plate tectonics. In fact, the plate tectonics either kicked off or were a product of Noah's flood. And there's tons of evidence for very rapid processes in geology. In fact, it, uh, it's hard to explain geology using slow. For instance, uh, why do the plates move at all? What, is there a conveyor belt underneath them? No. What's the force moving them? Nobody knows. But Dr. John Baumgartner, a friend of mine, uh, figured out using his massive computer program that he wrote that as soon as you start plate tectonics, the plate pushing down will almost liquefy the mantle and the plate starts falling really fast. So he used physics and chemistry to say, oh, if you start plate tectonics, you're going to get runaway plate tectonics, and the plates are going to move about as fast as a person can walk, not the rate the fingernails grow. So catastrophic plate tectonics is a very, not universally, but it's a strong, strongly accepted position within the creationist movement. Darwin had no clue about any of this. In fact, he got in a boat once and rode 120, no, he didn't row, <laughs> he was a rich guy. The sailors, the sailors rowed him 120 miles upstream. He was trying to cross the continent, like the, the Straits of Magellan, where you can go, oh, duh, you're in a river, man, the river's flowing downhill. Rivers don't do that. But he, he was trying to cross the continent, and he's looking at these rocks in, this, in the um, Santa Cruz River Basin, and they're really hard basalt rocks. And he said, no evidence, uh, no action of any flood could possibly have eroded these rocks because they're hard. So he thought that when the continents used to be sinking, the ocean eroded it, and the continents came back up again. And now we have these heavily rocks that would take a long time to erode. Uh, but modern geologists don't believe that. He didn't get up to the glacier that feeds the river at the, the head of the river. The Preto Moreno Glacier is actively calving, calving and um, from the evidence of the rocks around it, it looks like it used to be about a mile higher than it is now. It was this massive ice cap, and when it started melting, it exploded, and a massive wall of water came rushing down a couple of hundred miles to the Atlantic Ocean and carved the canyon. That's what the secular geologists are now saying. They're not uniformitarian anymore. They're actually neo-catastrophists. Just, again, like Sedwick, they put millions of years between the catastrophes. Huh. Got them full circle. He also, Darwin knew nothing about how sediments form. He never considered that the layers in Grand Canyon are thinner than a sheet of paper proportionally. Some of those sandstone layers outcrop here. These layers basically cover a continent. What produced those? Nothing like that's happening today. Sand being deposited at a river mouth doesn't form a completely flat sheet over thousands of square miles. It forms a delta. This is weird. Something very strange happened in Earth's history. The present is not the key to the past, and all you got to do is look at the rocks and see that because nothing today is making what we see. Something different must have happened. But he's ignoring that. He's forcing his thinking into a, a, new, way of, uh, a new way of thinking at the time. This is one of the cool articles on the accumulation of mud. I love that title. Science Magazine, one of the premier science magazines in the, in the world. These guys are studying particles. Now, you look at the White Cliffs of Dover. They're made of coccolithophore shells. Coccolithophores are little things in the water. They make these little calcium carbonate shells. They're so tiny. If you look at them under a microscope, they wiggle. You know why they wiggle? Because when a water molecule bumps into it at high speed, it moves it. That's how small they are. And if you just put them in water and let them start to settle, they estimate it would take about 100 years for one of these particles to settle from the top of the ocean to the bottom. So the White Cliffs of Dover clearly took millions of years to form, right? Now what they realize as they're studying this is that tiny particles stick together and become bigger particles. And you can actually get a, a, literally a waterfall of particles in an ocean that's cloudy, goes poof, 
and they can all be stripped out of the water column very quickly. They also realized, uh, following Guy Bertalt, who was a creationist doing studies on Winton flumes, that you can get multiple la layers laid down simultaneously. So what this guy did, he, he took some sand, black and white sand, mixed them together, and it had different densities. He just pours it into a, into a cylinder on the left, and it spontaneously forms black and white stripes. And the middle, to, the middle picture and the picture on the right, he had a flume, a raceway with water in it. And he's pouring sand, mixed sand, into the top of the raceway. And he's changing the speed of the water. And as he's doing that, he's getting all these different layers, some of them even coming down at an angle. And he's realizing that you can have a layer here and then a slope and another layer, and they're all forming simultaneously and moving like this sideways. What? Sediments are laid down horizontally? I thought they were supposed to be laid down vertically. One layer at a time. Count up the layers, count up the years, right? Oh. Darwin had no clue. So look at the asphalt at Mount St. Helens. 1980, this is June of 1980, we know when this happened. And we have all these little laminations, these little teeny layers. This is not millions of years, this is a couple of minutes. He wrote in The Origin of Species, no organism wholly soft can be preserved. Why did he write that? Because in a slow and gradual mindset, Anything that's soft will completely decay before it has a chance to be petrified. Does that make sense? So you should never get fossil jellyfish or sand ripples or fossilized raindrops or worms. Soft and squishy things are preserved throughout the entire fossil record. Because he was wrong about geology clear that squishy things can be petrified and the only way to do that is to bury it quickly and petrify it quickly I mean, how long does it take a jellyfish to rot not long or get eaten because i'll tell you what jellyfish favorite food of sea turtles is jellyfish they are food they don't lie on the bottom slowly as they're slowly buried over millions of years and petrified they would disappear quickly and we all over the fossil record we have soft and squishy things so let me ask you a question what is evolution what is it? Well, if you take the study of biology, the study of living things, I'm a biologist, I study living things. If you take the study of biology and apply to it a philosophy called naturalism, that's the belief that nature is all there is. It's the belief that natural processes can explain everything that happens. Notice you're excluding God, you're excluding miracles, you're excluding any intelligent creator from the beginning with naturalism. But if you take the, study, the philosophy of naturalism and apply it to the study of life, you will get some form of evolution. Now, I am a theist. I believe in God. If you take theism and apply it to biology, you're going to get some form of creation. Now, there's older creationists, there's uh, um, evolutionary creation, there's all sorts of different brands here. And if you ask me what I was, you want to put me in a box? You're going to call me a young earth creationist. I mean, I don't really like that label, but I, I can wear that. So I, look, I read the scientific, um, sorry, I read the historical statements in Scripture, and they clearly indicate that God created the universe only a few thousand years ago. Once you reject naturalism, anything is possible. God could have created the universe yesterday. He could have created it 10 trillion years ago. It doesn't matter. Whatever God said he did, he did. And our historical record indicates that he created the universe a little more than 6,000 years ago. But you have to reject naturalism first. Naturalism, though, here's the, the tricky part, it's a great science for the laboratory. When I run an experiment, I expect it to operate according to laws of statistics and probability. I don't think God's got his finger on the scale trying to tilt my experiment to one direction. There's not, there's not little ghosts coming around trying to interfere. With, no, it's, it's naturalistic. It's just mechanistic. It's just numbers. And it works great. And the evolutionists picked that up. Actually, it's an idea that the Christians developed in the 1600s. And then they, they, in the 1700s, the philosophers took that, got rid of God. And they said, yeah, scientific law exists. And they used that in, as a, an excuse for getting rid of God. Strange. The only reason scientific laws exist is because our God created the universe according to law because that's his nature, to be constant. 
they have no reason for believing in constancy. In fact, they come up with the, uh, the multiverse concept. You've heard of multiverses, right? Where you have all these different universes with different laws of physics in it. Oh, okay, um, how do we know the laws of physics in our universe are invariant? If they can vary from universe to universe, why can't they vary within a universe? Oh, that's not allowed. It's philosophically assumed away. What if the speed of light isn't constant? What if the passage of time isn't the same everywhere? What if, what if, what if? You can't know anything. It's really kind of funny that in order to, be, to believe in evolution, you have to make these gigantic philosophical assumptions, and they're greater than the Christian has to make who believes in God. But they do not want you to know that. I'll turn to some of biology now. Darwin knew nothing about the cell. To him, the cell was a bag of salts. And so if the cell was square or round or purple or had a spike, whatever, it can change because it, so, it was just a simple thing. They had this idea called protoplasm, early life. The cell was full of proto, it was almost like a vital force, the protoplasm. Now we call it cytoplasm. We got rid of this, this actually rather pagan concept that is a vital life force within living things. And this bag of salts to him meant it was easy for it to change. But once you start studying life, you realize it is mind-bogglingly complex and that living things are highly engineered. Let's say it this way. If life is simple, evolution might be possible. Not guaranteed, but it could be possible if life were simple. Life is not simple. All we know is life is hyper-complex. Sorry, Mr. Darwin, uh, you got a problem. In fact, um, there's one for you chemistry nerds. Biochemistry is the bane of every student ever studying biochemistry, and charts like this go on forever. The cell does incredibly improbable chemical reactions, chemical reactions that no living thing can anticipate. Chemical reactions have to be programmed into the cell. Chemical reactions that, in a test tube, some of the things that you depend upon to live would take like a billion, sometimes even a trillion years to go halfway to completion, and the cell can do it in a thousandth of a second. So why would the cell ever think, oh, I need this substance that it could never find in nature? And yet, oh, I'm making lots of the substance now. Oh, there's no forethought in evolutionary theory. And the leaps in cellular technology that we can see are simply incredible. And I use that in the old-fashioned as in not credible. It's unbelievable incredible. And yet there they are staring us in the face. Yeah, Darwin knew nothing about how complex life was. This is a map of the proteins found in a fruit fly. In yellow, can you see the little dots there? Back room probably can't, but there's little dots in the yellow zone there. Those are extracellular and membrane-bound proteins. In blue are the proteins in the cytoplasm. In green are the proteins found in the nucleus. And there's a square in the bottom right, there's a, and a zoom, and a, in the middle on the bottom, there's a zoom of the zoom, and there's a bunch of circles in there. I'm looking at the central circle. I see lines connecting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think, eight lines. And this is only one-third of the proteins that they found. Because if they put all the proteins on there, you see nothing but lines. What this is is showing us which proteins interact with which other proteins. When I say interact, I mean like a lock and a key. But that's one protein interacting with eight other proteins. Like, like let's say this is the protein. There's another protein that comes here and, and sticks a little USB dongle in there. There's another protein that comes in and turns it off or turns it on. There's another little protein that hits the advance button or, or hits the blank button or turns on the laser. And there's another protein that just wraps it up so no one can use it. And all of those have exactly specified structures. Change of structure, you're probably going to kill the animal. Yes, you can change some of these interactions between the proteins. Yep, you sure can. You can make a fruit fly with white eyes. You can make a fruit fly that has uh, legs instead of antenna. You can make a fruit fly with no wings. Okay, fine. Yep, you can do that. But most of the changes are lethal. Some of them are possible. Why? Because when God wrote the engineering specifications for a fruit fly, he put in some ability to adapt in certain ways. It's in the engineering specs of the animal. But most of the changes are actually deadly. 
And if that's true, how did that organism evolve? And if that's true now, how does it ever keep on evolving? Most changes are impossible. Some are possible, and that's what the evolutionists have been talking about for 100 years. They find the possible changes. Look at that. See that? Any change is possible. <laughs> no, dude, that's not true. You just don't know anything about how complex a cell is. Darwin also knew nothing about how fast species can form. That's funny because he wrote a book called The Origin of Species. It's a really interesting book uh, by Peter and Rosemary Grant. I met them by accident. Uh, these are actually some of my scientific heroes, even though they're full-blown evolutionists, fine, but they are doggedly persistent. They spent about 30 years or more every year flying down to the Galapagos, going to a little teeny island. I've seen the island. Um, and they will capture every bird on the island and tag it. And next year they come back, the next year they come back, and then they invented genetics, so they started taking blood samples. And they looked at what they found. They saw a species form in one year, brand new species. You see, birds, very often, um, a, a female bird growing up in a nest is listening to the sound of her father. And when she flies away, she finds a male bird that's singing the same song. The males in the nest learn the songs of their father. Well, they, they noticed an odd bird had flown to their island. It was bigger than the other birds, but it wasn't like other, other birds. And it turns out it was a hybrid itself of two species. And it flies to the island, and it somehow finds one of the island birds of a different species to mate with. And when the babies grow up, one of them flew off to mate with the mother species, but most of them actually intermated with themselves. And they keep on intermating with themselves now for about 10 years. And they are genetically and morphologically and behaviorally distinct. They are as different from the other birds as the species of birds are one year. Millions of years? No. In fact, it didn't take natural selection to produce it. It took hybridization. So imagine God creates a finch with lots of genetic diversity, oh, sorry, not even one. We know God started with two humans. He doesn't say that about any other species. And on board Noah's Ark, there's seven of each kind of bird, or seven pairs of each kind. So imagine there's probably 14 finches on board Noah's Ark. And when they come off the ark, they start mating, they start flying away. They get disconnected from each other. Maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand years later, they meet each other again. Either they don't like each other, they sing different songs, they don't, they don't mate, or sometimes they do mate. And you had this incredibly complex web of connections because God created it that way. And Darwin looks at it and says, oh, yeah, these changes are very slow. Oh, it must be taking millions of years. No, Darwin, you're looking at the end game. After most of the changes has happened because God, God engineered it to change, he's looking at these little teeny changes after thousands of years. Sorry. I, I'm, there's so many rabbit trails to follow here. Um, Darwin also had no idea that species could interbreed. His whole entire idea is split, 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 split. And evolutionists have known that lots of species can interbreed for years, and they're only recently coming to acknowledge that. This is in, in Science Magazine, shaking up the tree of life, and they have two different butterfly species hybridizing. Um, wait a minute, they're supposed to be different species. They're not supposed to mate, and yet all over the place. In fact, not just... Species within the same genus. Species within the same kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. Dogs can mate with coyotes that can mate with lynx, uh, not lynxes, that can mate with um, so all the dog types of things in the world. Dogs, coyotes, African jackals, wolves. and wolves, sorry, and red, red wolves and gray wolves. They can all intermate freely. There's no barriers to mating. They don't like each other. They smell different. They live in different places but they can intermate. All the cats in the world, little cats can interbreed with the wild cats, they can interbreed with lynxes, they can interbreed with pumas, they can interbreed with the uh, panthers, they can interbreed with lions and tigers. Now, kitty cats don't interbreed with tigers because a kitty cat gets eaten. <laughs> but theoretically, they can. There's a chain of connectivity between them, and we know genes flow between these species. What's a species? So we use the phrase created kind. 
In Genesis, God created a kind of something and a kind of something and a kind of something else. That's the phrase that's used, kind. Um, but he didn't tell us how many kinds he created, and he t- didn't tell us what the, the boundaries between the kinds are. We just know that he created independent kinds. And the two of each kind of unclean animal and seven of each kind or seven pairs of each kind of clean animal were on board the ark and seven pairs of birds. That's kind of cool because that means that we have a lot of science to do. We have a lot of exploring to do. We have learning to do. This is on the left, the um, marine iguana of the Galapagos. Darwin called them imps of darkness. <laughs> cool. They eat seaweed. They swim into the cold Galapagos waters, dive down, eat seaweed, and they have really strong climbing claws and muscles. And they climb up on the rocks, and they spend most of the time just sunning themselves. On the right is a land iguana. Darwin tried to chase one of these into the water, and he said he could not get it to go anywhere near where they hate water. They don't do anything except sit under the cactus and fight each other. And they sit under the cactus waiting for a flower to fall off. And they pounce out and they eat, the, they eat the flower. We're told that these things have been separated for like three to five million years. To put that in perspective, uh, that's the time frame that they think humans and chimpanzees have been separated. And they backed up the human clock. But at the time, three million for humans and chimpanzees, even when I was in, in graduate school, it was three million. Now it's like seven. But no one ever expected that these two things could be able to interbreed, and yet the first time a graduate student went out to an island to look for hybrids, and the first island that he looked at, he found them. I took that picture. It's superior to both of his parents. Well, maybe not. He doesn't swim, but he can climb like crazy. He doesn't wait under the cactus for the flowers to fall off. He climbs up the cactus, over the giant spines, and eats whatever he wants. Something called, we see it a lot, it's called hybrid vigor. See, speciation is a problem. Because as, as a, a, a species adapts to a finer and finer and finer environment, it gets pigeonholed, and it can't adapt anymore. And so what we see is God's created kinds kind of spidering outwards into these isolated things. Now, very often they can interbreed with someone else, another species, if you want to call them that, but they can't adapt any further because all the genetic diversity has been lost. That's the opposite of what Darwin taught, and that's what actually we see. Uh, here's an um, interesting photo on the top. Someone took a wolf and, and bred it with a mutt and made some very mean dogs. <laughs> so he let the puppies interbreed with each other, and they popped out with a mutt, a lab, a wolf, and the shaggy DA. Clearly, wolves and dogs are one species. That picture, the next picture there is a koi dog, a coyote dog mix. On the right is a, um, a book someone wrote, Living with Wolf Dogs. You know, if, if I wrote that book... Living with Wolf Dogs by Dr. Robert Carter, not recommended. The end. (laughs) The bottom picture, to me, is absolutely fascinating. The Russians needed a dog that could smell for drugs at the international airport in Moscow. But huskies have a lousy sense of smell. When you live in the freezing cold north, you don't want a big nasal cavity. So they said, well, we need an animal that can smell really good. Let's breed it with huskies. They went to Africa and grabbed an African jackal and bred it with a husky and made puppies. They were, they were kind of mean, so they bred it back into huskies. And a Sulamov dog is three-quarters husky and one-quarter African jackal, and they can smell like crazy when it's 20 below. What's a species? He wrote this, trying to correct the record of why he mislabeled his birds. Because he was a geologist, remember? He's collecting things. He's bringing them back to England. And he had all these birds that he sent to the the, the London Museum. And they used Captain Fitzroy's collection of birds. Remember Captain Fitzroy the Christian? Who correctly labeled what island he collected them from? To sort out Charles Darwin's collection of birds, which were not labeled, so that they could call them Darwin's finches and use them as this great example of evolution. Oh, I love the politics. But trying to, trying to explain what he did, he said, oh, it never occurred to me that the productions of islands only a few miles apart and placed under the same physical conditions would be dissimilar. I therefore did not attempt to make a series of specimens from the separate islands. <coughs> he said, evolution never occurred to him. That's what he just said. You ever hear that Charles Darwin invented the theory of evolution on the, on the Galapagos Islands? If you go online, you will see that everywhere. It is not true, and he wrote about it in his own journal. He wrote, 
Now, do I have that in here? Yes, 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 yes. Look at these two turtles on the Galapagos Islands. I took this, these photos. Notice the one on the left has a saddle right behind his head. The one on the right, the, the shell just slopes down. He writes in his journal, My attention was first called to this fact by the vice governor, Mr. Lawson, declaring that the tortoises differ from island to island, that he could with certainty tell from which island any one of them was brought. I did not for some time pay sufficient attention to this statement. Dot, dot, dot. I never dreamed. In other words, evolution never occurred to him. It was decades later when they're trying to make him the father of evolution that he's going back and trying to correct the historical record. There's a lot of politics happening here. You ever see this uh, picture from his notebook? You see that branching diagram? He writes, I think. And he writes what appears to be the world's first evolutionary tree. He has branches going back to a common ancestral species, and most of them are extinct, but he has A, B, C, and D written. Those are the surviving ones. This is from like the 1840s, 1830s maybe. He published uh, an Origin of Species in 1859. So we have this concept of the tree of life. Have you ever heard of the tree of life? Yeah, that's not what people believe today. You know that, right? Because there is no tree of life. If you sequence DNA from a vast array of living things, you will see there's no single tree. There is a random collection of genes found in the different branches. So if you want to actually draw how they're related, you have to draw this messy spider webby thing. There is no tree of life. So the evolutionists say, oh, a horizontal gene transfer. Once a gene evolved in one species in the early life forms, the other species would steal it and use that gene. Perhaps you've heard of the creationist forest. The idea that God creates independent groups of organisms, and then over time, some of them go extinct, some of them branch out and form new species, but they're all true to type. It's much closer to what I believe. Dogs are dogs. Whether you call them a wolf or a coyote or a jackal, it's still a dog. Cats are cats. Turtles are turtles. There's probably a couple of different types of turtles, but you get my point. And then there's this. I did this... Uh, a couple of years ago, I published an article series and I did a YouTube series called Species Are Designed to Change. And I took this creationist forest idea and I put it on steroids. Imagine this. God could have created any number of organisms in each kind that he wants. He could have put as much genetic diversity in there and he could have separated them into pockets or made them all together. But imagine that God creates something like some barnacles. Because Darwin's favorite thing was barnacles. Let's use barnacles. And he creates this one kind of barnacles that are interfertile, but he spreads them out into rocky outcrops around the world so that the barnacles can't fertilize each other. They're too far apart. Well, over time, maybe a barnacle attaches to a branch and floats across the ocean, and now this barnacle's on the other side of the ocean, they can interfertilize with the barnacles over there. But maybe the barnacles are in one spot, they're maybe tall and narrow, and in another spot, they're wide and short. And maybe you have wide, narrow ones and short, tall ones or whatever, and, and intermediate ones. So they'd actually look different. But if one of them gets over to the other place, it's going to mix its genes together, and you can have brand new types of barnacles that you never saw before. Brand new forms that God did not initially create. But he put the specifications for those forms within those things and separated the specifications in different pockets. And so when they finally hybridize, you get a totally different type of barnacle, brand new. And is that evolution? No. It's God being a genius. And then maybe over, now my, I have three slices of time here. The middle selection, that's the flood. We don't even know what God created. We only have the organisms that died during the flood. 1,500 years after creation. And then today, maybe some of those floods survived. The things that are in the flood didn't make it. They're not even here today. Maybe some of them survived. And what we see is within the space that God allowed these organisms to live, we see them moving and changing over time. That's not evolution. It's creationism. So Darwin's got nothing to talk about now. We just stole this thunder. Darwin also had no clue what natural selection could and could not do. And yet that was the center point of his main theory. 
Um, John Sanford and I published a paper on the influenza virus, the H1N1 flu. From 1917 till 2009, we looked at mutation accumulation in the virus. And we saw, first of all, it was a straight line. That was very interesting. But then we realized that natural selection can't remove the mutations. This virus is at war with the human immune system. Only the strongest viruses are passed from one person to the next. And yet mutations are accumulating anyway. So despite all that natural selection, mutations still accumulate because natural selection actually can't do very much at all. All it can do is take out the worst offenders, the most mutant. You all carrying mutations. You all were born with about 100 mutations your parents were not born with. And your parents were born with about 100 mutations your grandparents weren't born with. Those mutations are building up in the human population over time. Eventually, maybe thousands of years from now, we will all be extinct. Because natural selection can't remove them. And yet, each one of them is such, has such a small effect that I don't feel like a mutant. But I'm not nearly as robust as Adam would have been. Or even Noah. Because after thousands of years, we've all picked up debilitating mutations. Hmm. Natural selection is actually impotent. Not only can it not prevent extinction, it can't drive all the diversity that Darwin needed it to drive. Oh yeah, Darwin knew nothing about genetics. That's funny. The, the whole idea of evolution is a genetic idea, and yet he did not know about DNA. He did not know the laws of inheritance. In fact, Gregor Mendel published the laws of inheritance a couple of years after the origin of species, and I read a paper once. I, I can't find it now. I'm looking for it. It looks like if you look at Gregor Mendel's papers, they exactly parallel Darwin's points in the origin of species. No wonder people forgot about Mendel. In fact, he's got about 100 references to his works before he was supposedly rediscovered. His works were in all the major universities. Everyone knew Mendel was there, but they knew that Mendelism was a threat to Darwinism. So it wasn't until the 1930s where they put the two things together, where Mendel's tall and short and purple and white, those are mutations. Oh, yes, yeah, so you, now you can have all these traits appearing because of mutation. That's called neo-Darwinism. But Darwin, had, he had no idea. Look at the human genome. You want to talk about a miracle? You know how much DNA you have inside each one of your cells? You know how big your cells are? Right? They're, they're tiny. You can't even see them, right? You know how much DNA you have? This much. You have six feet of a linear, sticky, very imaginably skinny molecule packed into every one of your cells. If you want to scale that up, let's say let's make the cell as big as a grapefruit. Well, your hair... Uh, your, so your DNA would be about as thick as your hair. That's the proportions we're talking about. You'd have 32 miles of hair inside your grapefruit. And now, let's say that you have written on that hair, dot, you know, maybe you took a Sharpie one, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 Morse code. And you Morse code the entire genome into that ball of, of, of hair. And I say to you, okay, um, it's puberty. Go find the genes that are turned on during puberty. And don't make any knots as you ruffling through all this, this, this hair. To oh, there it is right there. That's what we're talking about here. Genetics is incredibly complicated. Uh, um, Dr. Howard wrote this article about no, 2009. Well, that was a long time ago now. Why didn't Darwin discover Mendel's laws? Darwin had more money than Mendel, more time than Mendel, and he was actively working on these ideas. In fact, in one of his books, uh, the, the uh, Variations of Plants and Animals Under Domestication, he has the results of a, di a classic dihybrid cross with a three-to-one ratio right there in his book, and he never discovered it. Why? Because of his preconceptions. Darwin was not looking for genes that are shuffled and passed from one generation to the next. He was looking for absolute variability. He doesn't need a gene for tall and short. He needs a gene for everything in between also. So to him, species were spongible. They're morphable. You can have them change any way. You can't have specific instructions inside a cell to tell the cell what to do. That's why Mendelism was a threat to Darwinism and why Mendel would be held back for a long time. Darwin also didn't know anything about how people were, were um, related 
Now, I know this evolutionary tree or chart, evolutionary chart of human history is biased. They've got humanity operating or arising in Africa, whatever. But this is looking at the little piece of DNA you only get from your mother. It's called the mitochondria. And because you only get it from your mother, and it's passed intact from generation to generation to generation. Except every once in a while, a mutation will happen, and that forms a new branch in the family tree. And when you look at all the branches of the family tree, wow, they all go back to a single woman. Wow, that's a direct biblical prediction. Now, the evolutionists put that woman in Africa on purpose, because it can't be Eve. No, 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 no. But if you look at the mutation rate in modern humans, yeah, yeah that woman only lived a few thousand years ago. Oh, yeah. That's what the Bible says, too. But putting all that aside, he had no idea how closely related we all are. Shockingly so. In fact, that's my, I'm going to talk about more in my, in my next talk, too. His ideas about race have turned out completely false. Now, I'm going to read something to you. Uh, this is meant to make you angry. This should turn your stomach. If this doesn't turn your stomach, then may God have mercy on your soul because you've got a problem. He wrote this in The Descent of Man in 1871. At some future period, not distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man, which he meant himself, Europeans, will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropological apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest ally will then be wider for intervene between man in a more civilized state and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. That is not politically correct. This is one reason why some people are trying to throw Darwin under the bus. Because he thought Europeans were more highly evolved than the other people in the world. He would put um, Asians second. He would put brown people third and black people on the bottom. Ugh. Sedwick again, remember him? He writes Darwin a month after the origin is published. I've read your book with more pain than pleasure. Whoa, what? I, parts I read with absolute sorrow because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. You've deserted the true method of an induction. Could you imagine being reprimanded from one of your heroes like that? He continues. Now, at this point in his book, he's talking about the link between the, the physical and the more uh, the spiritual realms. The old um, debate amongst philosophers, are we a machine or is there a ghost in the machine? Your children of the 80s like me, do you remember the police album, Ghost in the Machine? That's, that's exactly the question. Are we spirits in a material world or are we just material? Well, he says... Were it possible, thank, which thank God it is not, to break the link between the spiritual and the physical. Humanity in my mind would suffer damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since his written records tell us of its history. That guy predicted the first half of the 20th century where more people died because of evolutionary theory driving Nazi Germany, driving communist China, driving... Um, the Soviet Union, driving Cambodia when they went communist, than any other time in history. Millions upon millions of millions of people died. So how could Joseph Stalin sleep at night after he signed a warrant knowing it's going to lead to the death of 30,000 people, like the time he decided to kill all the engineers? How could he sleep at night? Well, to him, killing people is no different than cutting the grass. Because people don't have a soul. People aren't special. To him, they're just machines. Said would call them out. Darwin also didn't know he'd be beaten to the punch. There's uh, Rasmus Darwin. Edward Blythe was a eh, special creationist, we call him. Probably an old earther, though. I'm not sure about his Christianity. But he definitely appealed to the Bible. Um, and he's talking about natural selection in the 1820s. And we know Darwin read that because we have that edition of that journal with Darwin's handwritten notes in it. Alfred Russell Wallace comes out with evolutionary theory right before Darwin. Now, we don't call it Wallacean evolution because Wallace was a poor man, not a rich man. In Victorian society, you underclasses never did anything. And they read Darwin's paper that he wrote real quick and Wallace's paper together, and everyone forgot about Wallace after that. Wallace writes, every species come into existence, 
coincident in time and space with pre-existing species. That's called evolution. Et cetera. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to drive to the end here. I'm going to claim for the last section, very briefly, Darwin did not know Jesus, and this is very important. First of all, his mother and his wife were Unitarians. That's not Christianity. His father and grandfather called themselves free thinkers. One of uh, Thomas Huxley coined the phrase agnostic, so they couldn't have called, called themselves agnostic or even atheist. Those words didn't exist yet. Darwin called himself an agnostic. There is no evidence in any of his writings that he even understood what Christianity is. And very importantly, he did not recant on his deathbed. That is a myth. That is an urban myth. It's not true. We have his letters right up to the end of his life, written to other people and other people writing to him. He did not change his mind. He writes in his autobiography. Thus, disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow I felt no distress and have never since doubted, even for a second, that my conclusion was correct. I can indeed hardly to see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be, to be true. Then he says he's surrounded by atheists here. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all of my friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is damnable doctrine. Pardon my French. But it's not really a swear word. It's just an uncomfortable word to say from a pulpit. Uh, Charles Darwin, how dare you use that word? You have no definition of the word, first of all. Second of all, you have no ability to judge anyone else for any moral or even ethical action or belief. In fact, he writes, A man who has no assured or never present belief in the existence of a personal God or a future existence with retribution and reward, that's heaven and hell, can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow his impulses and instincts, which are the strongest or seem to him the best ones. You know what that's called? Hedonism. Welcome to America in the year 2023. Where do you think this comes from? It comes from the philosophical underpinnings. Evolution even isn't that important. It's the lack of God the appeals to nothing but naturalism. And once that's true, who cares what anyone else does? There's no judge over me. I can do what I wish. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to ask you one final question. If Darwin were alive today, knowing all we know about cellular technology, all the complexity of the cell, all the amazing things we still see in living things, would he still come up with evolutionary theory? I see this, and I see this, and I see this. Well, let me give you this. Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to law of God. Neither indeed can be. Now, I don't know that he would come up with evolutionary theory. He might say aliens did it. He would come up with something. There must be a replacement for the God that he knows exists. And yet, it is fully possible, according to the Bible, that people can harden their hearts and no longer believe in God. And honestly, I think they're not troubled by it. They just simply don't believe in God anymore. But the evidence is so abundantly clear that I don't know anyone who believes in nothing. I know plenty of people who believe in things other than Darwinism, and they usually don't even realize the philosophy, the background, the behind, the, what's behind what they're saying. And in the end, they're just trying to deny the God of the Bible. All right, I'm going to stop there. Come back. How long a break are we going to have? Okay. Um, I skipped over stuff. I, I didn't even tell you that from the time of 29 until he died in his 70s that Charles Darwin was housebound, that he was agoraphobic, that he had a mirror, a full-length mirror in the right inside the, uh, the front door of his mansion. And at the end of the hallway, he'd be sitting in a study with his doors cracked. And when the door opened, he'd look up at the mirror, and if it was an unannounced visitor, he'd run away. And he says if he was caught at unawares, he would throw up for three days. No, this is a rich man who is formerly famous, because it's a round-the-world version, who's a good storyteller that his friends hand-picked to do something they weren't willing to do. 
He was their point man. They knew he would never have to stand on the stage and defend himself because he wouldn't have ever done it. And when he wrote The Origin of Species, they bought, they purchased every single, ver, uh, every single printing of that first printing. And they sent it to every influential person in government, religion, and academia in Europe and America. And the entire intellectual world was talking about one thing overnight. It was a coup d'etat, and it was brilliant. But it was political, it was philosophical, 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 and at its core, it was atheistic. You good with that? You gonna ask a question? I'm already long. Yeah? That's right. That's right. But in 1859, he did not dare to talk about the evolution of humans. He waited till 1871 to publish the, um, the Descent of Man. Now, the book that I have half written, um, Adam and Eve and the Descent of Man. Yes, I'm stealing Charles Darwin's title. Um, but you have to wait several years before that comes out. All right, let's, let's pray. Let's, let's close up this with, with prayer. I think we need this now. Father, we wrestle against principalities and powers. There are some dark forces in this world that we have only vaguely see. We're wrapped up enough in our own selfishness and sin and, and blindness that sometimes we're just not handling this very well. Father, help us to see. Help us to know. Help us to be aware of the spiritual battle that's raging around us. And Lord, help us to hold out our hand to the people we see drowning in that sea. We now know more than we did, and we have less excuse now than we did. But Lord, we're counting on you, because we need help. This is scary, it's complicated, and it's um, very, very important. Amen. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's take about 10 minutes. Stretch your legs. We're going to be right back in here. Like I said, the bathrooms are both this way. Don't forget the book table out front. But in about 10 minutes, so we'll say 15 till, we'll come back. Uh, and we've got a couple things to take care of there, and then we'll get right back into the next talk, all right? Ten minutes.